All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our grand round today. We have Dr. Donsky. Uh, Dr. Donsky began his education at Vertebro College where he received his BS in biology. He then attended the Medical College of Wisconsin and completed his medical doctorate degree. To continue his training, he went to Brown University for his residency in internal medicine. Um, he also completed his chief resident year in internal medicine at Brown. He then chose to specialize in infectious diseases and came to Case Western for his fellowship and later became part of the faculty. Currently, Dr. Donsky is a professor of medicine at Case Western, a staff physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases, and chairman of the Infection Control Committee at the Cleveland VA Medical Center. Uh, throughout his career, Dr. Donsky has had much success with his contributions to science. The goal of his laboratory is to develop improved strategies to prevent infections due to healthcare-associated pathogens, especially routes of transmission and impact of interventions. He has published many papers and has been the recipient of numerous, numerous grants for his research. In addition, he sits on the editorial boards and has received a, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control slash the American Journal of Infection Control Award for publication excellence among all our awards. Please join me in welcoming him to our grand rounds today. Okay, thank you all uh, for attending. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about new developments in epidemiology and control of healthcare associated pathogens. Uh, these are my disclosures. I've received research support from a number of companies. Um, I won't be talking about any specific products, though, uh, today that are relevant to this presentation. So my objective will be to present cases and questions that illustrate new developments in epidemiology and control of healthcare associated pathogens. And I will start, however, with just a couple of general principles uh, to get us all oriented to infection control. So when we think about pathogen transmission in the hospital, uh, the patients and the environment contribute to transmission of almost all of the organisms that we deal with in the hospital. So infected patients uh, will shed the organisms and contaminate their skin and contaminate environmental surfaces in their rooms. And pa susceptible patients can acquire pathogens directly from contact with contaminated surfaces. Uh, so if a room is not adequately cleaned before the next patient is admitted, you can touch a bed rail and pick up a pathogen and, and acquire C. diff or BRE. Um, and uh, I'll, the other main route of transmission, however, and pr probably the main route of transmission is healthcare personnel. So we are the primary vector, and primarily our hands serve as a vector for transmission. And we can pick up pathogens either by touching patients directly or by touching environmental surfaces. Uh, this is just one illustration of that. Uh, this is contamination of hands with MRSA after contact with a patient and then with the same patient's environment, and the environment in this case is the patient's bed rail. And so as you can see, we, you know, we, we examine the patient, we put our hands down on this plate. There are literally hundreds of MRSA colonies. All of those pink colonies are MRSA acquired on our hands, and we can then transfer those uh, MRSA to the next patient. Uh, and same thing, with the, we tend to pick up less organisms from the environment, but just touching this patient's bed rail, you can see that we acquired a number of MRSA colonies. Uh, thankfully, alcohol hand hygiene is very effective at eliminating these, path, these uh, MRSA organisms from our hands. So with that, with those routes of transmission in mind, our basic infection control practices really are hand hygiene for, uh, foremost uh, with gloves and gowns if you have a, a particular pathogen, C. diff, which is not killed by alcohol, for example, um, environmental cleaning, and then added in the past decade to our, our strategies to prevent infection is chlorhexidine bathing. And so the idea here is something we call source control. So if we imagine our patient is covered from head to toe in MRSA and we bathe them every day with chlorhexidine, we will reduce the likelihood that when you come in and examine that patient, you'll get MRSA in your hands and transmit it. And also if that patient has a central line, you'll reduce the likelihood that that MRSA will get onto the line and cause a bloodstream infection. And in fact, so chlorhexidine bathing in the ICU the, the best evidence for that practice is for preventing central line associated bloodstream infections due to, due to you know, staff and VRE and other organisms. And then finally, decolonization, which is primarily a strategy for MRSA, which is in many institutions is now a standard practice in, in the ICU, uh, with the concern being that we're concerned about uh, potential for emergence of resistance. So, one other basic uh, principle to, to discuss is that. Delays in recognition of infectious patients will contribute to transmission. This is just one illustration of this. Of this. Uh, in Saudi Arabia and South Korea, they had MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus outbreaks, uh, 2014 and 15. Many of these cases were healthcare associated, and many of them were actually transmissions to healthcare personnel. Uh, 
most of the transmissions occurred before infection was recognized. And so in this case, and these are, these are some examples of that, so the white dots represent infected patients. The green dots represent healthcare personnel who are taking care of those patients. So in the top example there, we have a patient who spread MERS to four healthcare personnel who were taking care of that patient who had respiratory symptoms without realizing that this patient had, had, uh, had MERS. Uh, and it, once they, and the second case actually below is even more impressive, one patient spread to literally a dozen healthcare personnel acquired MERS. So this is a patient who, are, and, and the scenario here is you have a patient who has a high burden of virus and is receiving pretty intensive healthcare uh, interventions by personnel. So you're getting very close to this patient and have a high, lot of potential to pick up these organisms if you're not following droplet precautions. And the other point uh, to make about this is that the, the, most of the transmissions were linked to a small number of what we call super spreaders. So there are, there, if there were 100 or so cases of MERS in, those, in that facility, 85% of the transmissions were linked to only five of them. And this is the case for, for almost all of the pathogens that we deal with. If we're dealing with C. diff or VRE. There are certain patients who have a very high burden of those organisms who are particularly likely to, uh, to transmit. And I'll come back to that point, uh, that point later. Uh, this, although this is MERS, and we haven't, we're not seeing MERS here at University Hospitals, there's a great example that's very similar uh, that we deal with, that we just got done dealing with here, and that's influenza. So for, we know there are, there are similar examples of transmission in healthcare facilities of flu uh, to, from patients to healthcare personnel and from healthcare personnel to patients. And if we had one good example at the VA where we did an M&M where we had a patient who was on our long-term care facility who presented with respiratory symptoms, had a possible infiltrate, was started on antibiotics for possible pneumonia, went to the ICU, and then it was finally when the, when the admitting resident uh, who was picking the patient up to take them up to the medical floor said, you know, maybe this, this patient has flu. The syndrome was very consistent with in influenza. Um, and the, the diagnosis of influenza was made uh, you know, three days after the patient uh, was already being transferred around the hospital, uh, potentially spreading flu. Uh, so let's move now to cases and questions. So here's... Is back there? What's going on? <laughs> All right. Yeah, no problem. Um, so our first... Our first example, so the, so the, the first example really is, is addresses the major development in, uh, in infection control in the past decade, and that is the idea that we should all be striving to get to zero, meaning zero healthcare-associated infections. And this drives everything we're doing in infection control now, and it's the initial paper that, that set this movement to get to zero in motion was published in the New England Journal in 2006, and it was an intervention to reduce uh, central line-associated bloodstream infections. And the first part of that, that's the first couple of years show the effect of their intervention. So this is the mean rate of central line-associated bloodstream infections for 121 Michigan ICUs from 73 hospitals. And the idea here was that rather than waiting around, this is kind of the quality people driving this intervention, rather than waiting around for a perfect randomized trial to decide what we're going to do in infection prevention for CLABSIs, let's take the best evidence that we have, let's put together a bundle of approaches, apply them, and see if we can reduce, actually reduce infections, and that's what they did here, and this is the mean rate of central line associated infections, and as you can see, there was a dramatic drop uh, when they did this uh, intervention, and if you continue to follow the, the line, you can see that over the past decade, that reduction in central line associated infections has been maintained uh, throughout that decade. Bruce, yes. Okay. Apparently, they're drilling on the sixth floor. All right, good. All right, good. 
Um, and so part of, the, part of the inspiration here to get to zero was that when they actually looked at the initial time period, it was, they're looking at 121 at ICUs, the median uh, number of central line infections after this intervention was zero. So a number of facilities over a period of a year went, that went to zero infections. And so the, the kind of the bean counters, the government, the uh, administrators said, why don't we all shoot for that goal of getting to zero? And so here's question number one. Uh, and there, I can tell you there are hospitals in the Cleveland area uh, that we all know that are, that are faced with this actual question. So your hospital is receiving a financial penalty because you have high uh, catheter-associated urinary tract infection rates, which is most likely to be effective in lowering your cauti or, or, or urinary tract infection rate. Is it reducing overuse of urinary catheters, catheter insertion and maintenance bundles, uh, antimicrobial coated catheters, or reducing the number of urine cultures sent. And so the thing that's most likely to improve the care for your patients is, is A, reducing overuse of urinary catheters. That's what we want to do. We want to make sure there's no unnecessary catheters being used. They put patients at risk for infection. Um, the problem with that is that that may not lower your, your infection rate because you're actually lowering the denominator, the number of catheter days that they're using to, to judge your program on. So you may not actually lower your rate at all by uh, reducing unnecessary mm -hmm. catheter use. Catheter insertion and bu maintenance bundles are important, but they're not necessarily that effective. Antimicrobial coated catheters have been very effective for central line infections uh, reduction, but less impressive for uh, preventing catheter social UTIs. So the answer here is D. The most likely uh, intervention to be effective is reducing the number of urine cultures. And it actually makes sense that we could probably all reduce the number of cultures we send from patients who have, who have uh, urinary catheters. So here's a study that, that looked at this, um, at looking at catheter-associated UTI. Fever was the indication for 97% of urine cultures in the ICU. 68% of them had some potential alternative explanation for fever. Only 6% of them had a positive blood culture. No one ever during the course of this study modified their antibiotics based on a urine culture result. And so their conclusion was most febrile Cauti patients did not have a true UTI. What we're seeing here, patients who have a Foley catheter will become colonized with bacteria, and that, that's an expected outcome. And if you check a urine culture, you're going to get a positive, uh, even if they have fever for some other reason. And so uh, one of our former residents uh, at the Cleveland Clinic is the first author on a, on a kind of a groundbreaking study looking at this principle that we should just reduce urine, urine cultures uh, to reduce CLABSIs. Uh, counties, I should say. So this is Kate Mullen uh, at, the, in the, at the Cleveland Clinic. So they did all of the usual approaches to try to reduce uh, catheter-associated UTIs and saw, continued to see high rates of counties. They got together with the intensivists. Everybody got together to discuss what to do about this, and their plan was to, to stop sending urine cultures, and their mantra was no more pan culture. So instead of when you have a fever in the ICU, you can send blood cultures, you can do other workup, but you're not going to automatically send a urine culture. And so the blue bars there show urine cultures. And as you can see, they dramatically uh, reduced the number of urine cultures that they were sending in, from the ICU. And with that, the, the orange line shows the rates of, of infections. They saw a dramatic reduction in, uh, in, infect, in catheter associated urinary tract infections. And, and this was uh, and without any real evidence of harm to patients. And other people are doing similar things even for uh, central line-associated bloodstream infections. Uh, there are also other approaches that people are taking. This, the drive to reduce, cent, uh, reduce infections has also led to some other interventions that may be actually more useful um, and not just mis kind of massaging our numbers. This is an implementation of a female external urinary device to decrease catheter-associated UTI. So this is currently being implemented at uh, Metro. Uh, where uh, Brooke Watts, one of our former VA colleagues, is, is implementing this system. Uh, this was a study that was just presented a week ago at the hospital epidemiology meeting. They replaced indwelling urinary catheters, uh, unless you had urinary retention or needed bladder irrigation with this external urinary management device. Uh, this is hooked up to suction, so you actually pull urine away from the uh, GU tract and you can measure urine output. They had a 50% reduction in the incidence of catheter-associated UTI uh, was well accepted by patients, nurses, and uh, physicians. Okay. Uh, 
case number two, and what I will hopefully impart to you by the end of this case, is that catheter-associated UTIs and C. diff have a lot in common. So here we have, there's a patient from the VA, a 70-year-old nursing home resident. He presented with abdominal distension, possible sepsis, had a bit of an elevation in his white count, partial obstruction of his colon, and he received enemas and laxatives, which resulted in some loose stools, although he still had a partial obstruction. And so someone ordered a test for C. diff, which was positive by PCR on hospital day four. So by definition, this patient has healthcare-associated C. difficile infection, and if our goal is to get to zero C. diff infections, we failed in this case. And so the question is, what can we do about that? The surgery to correct this patient's bowel obstruction was due to a fecal ball, and this was delayed while treating his C. diff for several days. So the surgeons, so despite the fact that they were treating him for C. diff, he continued to have obstruction. The surgeons opened the patient up. They went in, they found this large, for whatever reason, had a giant fecal ball in his ascending colon. They went in and manually broke it up, milked it out of the colon, and the patient's obstruction resolved, and he got better. They did a flex, we have no evidence that this patient really had C. diff infection. The suspicion is that this patient very likely was just colonized with C. diff. They did a flex sig, there was no evidence of pseudomembranes. The clinical presentation was not consistent with C. diff, and his symptoms resolved after relieving his obstruction. And we have lots of evidence that there are similar cases, and that many patients who have healthcare-associated C. diff infection, in fact, are asymptomatic carriers of C. diff who we're picking up because we kind of have overzealous testing. So here's the background on this. Asymptomatic carriage of toxic C. diff is common on hospital admission. Four to 15% of patients will carry C. diff coming into the hospital. A significant proportion of patients who are diagnosed with C. diff are colonized on admission. So 25% of ICU patients, 40% of stem cell transplant patients. We've just completed a study at the VA and looked at patients over a period of time with hospital-associated C. diff infection. 45% of them were carrying the infecting strain at the time they came into the hospital. Even though we're calling them healthcare-associated, we're obviously not going to prevent those infections if the patients are already carrying those strains coming into the hospital. And so the question is, how can we avoid false positive diagnosis of CDI and asymptomatic carriers? And we're facing the same pressures for C. diff that we face for urinary tract infections or CLABSIs, in that there are currently guidelines for how much, if you're an outlier in C. diff infection, you may see reductions in your payments from Medicare, and you may be highlighted in the newspaper for your high rates. So how can we avoid this? So imagine we have a patient who's admitted to the hospital. They're colonized with C. difficile infection. We give them laxatives, as we did for our patient. And then they develop a loose stool. You order C. diff testing. The PCR is positive, as in our patient. So there are two approaches, and these are currently, they're highlighted in the current guidelines for C. diff management. And one is the European approach, primarily in England. They're the champions of this approach. And that is that you would have our patient. They have a fecal ball, and they have a loose stool after you get a laxative. And they say, test that patient anyway. That's the bottom British approach. You do the GDH or PCR to screen for C. diff. And then you follow that up with a toxin EIA. And you use the toxin to determine if the patient really has an infection, or if they may be an asymptomatic carrier. So in this case, if our patient, presumably if they're an asymptomatic carrier, we gave some diarrhea with our laxative, they would be toxin negative. And you would put that patient in isolation. We'd call them a fecal excreter, but you would not necessarily treat them for C. diff. And this approach, I would just tell you that hospitals in town are in discussions about what to do with C. diff diagnostic testing. So Metro is currently moving toward the British C. diff testing approach. At UH and a lot of other places in the U.S., PCR is still the standard for C. diff testing. And the goal in this case would be to avoid inappropriate testing. So in the case where our patient had received a laxative and had a loose stool afterward, which would be anticipated, you would have some program in place to avoid sending that stool sample for testing. You would never find out that that patient has C. diff, and therefore you would never diagnose a C. diff in an asymptomatic carrier. That is the approach that University Hospital, so Amy Ray is leading this, along with one of our residents, is leading this to try to do an intervention to reduce inappropriate testing here 
at UH. Here's an example of how this would work. Uh, this is a real-time electronic intervention to reduce inappropriate CDI testing. So electronic patient data tracking of diarrhea documentation and laxative use was implemented. So they got the nurses to improve their documentation of diarrhea in the chart. And they uh, had the computer, so the EPIC computer system was able to flag samples. When samples came down to the microbiology lab, it would be flagged if the patient had, di you'd have to, you would have information in the micro lab if the patient had diarrhea or if they, had, or if they were on a laxative. So if the patient was on a laxative, as in our current patient, the, the stool sample would be rejected by the micro lab, and you would have to call to override, uh, override the rejection of the test. In this case, 16% of CDF test orders were canceled by the lab. The intervention decreased healthcare onset CDI by 25%, decreased oral vancomycin days of therapy by 32%, and there were no increased complications. So I would say again that this, this suggests to us that C. diff is very much like catheter-associated UTI. A lot of the cases that we are, doc, we are diagnosing as healthcare-associated C. diff infection in reality are probably patients who are asymptomatically colonized, same thing with, with having a Foley catheter, and the way we're going to have to address this is by changing the way we do test, test, uh, uh, yeah, testing uh, stewardship is the main approach here. Uh, just a couple of other quick comments about C. diff. Um, the other kind of major thing that's changed our thinking about C. diff infection has been the advent of, kind of very discriminatory molecular typing, uh, in this case, whole genome sequencing. So this is data from the VA. Uh, these are sources of healthcare-associated CDI based on whole genome sequencing. And we, we collected all of the C. diff positive samples over the course of six months and also screened uh, for asymptomatic carriage in a long-term care facility residents. And if you can appreciate the middle of the slide, um, we found that we could attribute some of our cases, so our new CDI cases were linked to long-term care facility residents who were either asymptomatic carriers or CDI cases. About 20% of all C. diff cases were linked to long-term care facility residents. There were zero cases of healthcare-associated C. diff, a hospital-associated C. diff, that were linked to other hospital-associated C. diff cases. So in essence, we are at zero. We've gotten to zero uh, transmission of C. diff, at least at this point in time. But the, you know, the people who are following our C. diff, healthcare-associated C. diff rates see that we're not anywhere close to zero because we have an entire pool of C. diff patients where we don't know where they're acquiring C. diff infection. So if you look over here, uh, the unknown, 80% of our, of our C. diff infection, we have no idea where they're coming from. Uh, they're, not, they're, not, they're apparently not coming from other hospital-associated cases, and they're not coming from our long-term care facility residents. So there may be other asymptomatic carriers in the hospital that are contributing. Uh, the other consideration is that, and, and what, we're, what, we, what we think may be happening is a lot of C. diff is being imported from the community. There's a large community reservoir of C. diff. Uh, and so there are a number, and this is a, there's a major movement in, in Europe and in Australia to look at community reservoirs of C. diff and try to, try to gauge you know, where C. diff is really coming from. So the, the evidence is that you can find C. diff out in the community. So dogs, uh, will often, pets will often carry C. diff. Uh, babies, uh, up until about the age of six months, it's very common for babies to carry C. diff. We're currently doing a study uh, with, with Rainbow, with Phil Tolsis at the Rainbow, and seeing about half of babies are carrying toxin-producing strains of C. diff out to a year of age. Um, and if you have, apparently if you have dogs and babies in the household at the same time, it even increases your risk even more of having been carrying C. diff. Uh, wastewater treatment. So it makes sense that if you have a wastewater treatment plant, there's going to be some C. diff because wastewater is going into the, into the treatment plant. So it turns out that if you actually culture wastewater that has been treated coming out of the wastewater treatment plant, it also will have C. diff in it. So wastewater treatment is not very good at eliminating uh, C. diff and, in fact, and other pathogens as well from water. So what are we doing with treated wastewater? You can dump it back into the river somewhere, but like half of it is being used to irrigate crops, and therefore it makes sense that if you, if you culture lettuce and other fruits and vegetables, you may find some C. diff there, uh, and you, it can, it's also cultures young animals, so food animals, so meats, vegetables, et cetera. There's a lot of C. diff out there, um, and it's in, all, it's in households as well, so we, somebody went around and cultured households in the Houston area and found a lot of C. diff. And then finally, I'll just mention in, uh, in Australia, they just published a recent study where they found that the common, common uh, 
areas out in the community where often the, the soil was often contaminated uh, with C. diff spores, and it turned out that they were using pig manure when they're in the processing of uh, top, topsoil for uh, common uh, areas in, in Australia. So lots of potential sources for C. diff out in the community. And then the final point I would just make is that even though uh, we have a lot of community-associated C. diff and people in the community are carrying C. diff, there also is a lot of potential interest in the fact that a lot of our healthcare is being delivered in outpatient settings now, so outpatient healthcare facilities are another potential source for C. diff. And I would just, just to point out that possibility, uh, this is movement of wheelchairs uh, within the Cleveland VA during a three-day period. So our escort service keeps track of, of where they're going in the, hot, in the healthcare facility. Um, and so every day they make about 300 trips with patients in the facility. So in yellow are shown, shown trips that involve the long-term care facility or acute care, and in blue are shown outpatients. And so what you can appreciate there is a, there's a tremendous amount of intersection uh, be, between outpatients and inpatients in our specialty care clinics and in radiology. So if someone can come into our hospital for an outpatient appointment, never be admitted to the hospital, and potentially be exposed to C. diff and other resistant pathogens. Okay, so the next case. You have four patients. Uh, we'll change, change gears a little. So we have four patients in the ICU with pseudomonas infections. Which would you consider as a potential source? Is it dirty laundry, contaminated stool softener, contaminated chlorhexidine, or contaminated sinks? And so all of these are potential sources of infection. So there are a number of recent outbreaks um, where it's been pointed out that dirty laundry can be a source of fungal infection. So a lot of, a lot of hospitals send their laundry out to some, some outside facility to process all of their sheets and things, and then it comes back in. And if there's, uh, if they're not, if there's not care taken, you can end up with things like mucor uh, on, your, on your laundry. And in high-risk patients, that can be a potential risk. There was an outbreak in, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania recently related to this. Uh, there was an outbreak of uh, Burkhardaria serpatia related to contaminated stool softener. Uh, contaminated chlorhexidine, actually, our main concern with chlorhexidine, it's very effective against gram positives, that there are some of the gram negatives may actually be quite good at pumping out chlorhexidine. Uh, and there was, you can actually, in some cases, grow Burkhardaria in chlorhexidine. But the, the number one source that, you, that, that we have not really thought about as much in the past is sinks and other healthcare uh, water systems. So this is something you should all be aware of because it's something that outside of, in fact, this is uh, kind of exponentially increasing in terms of the number of publications and in interest. So organisms linked to sinks are almost all gram negatives. As you can see here, especially Pseudomonas and Pseudomonas family organisms like Acinetobacter. Uh, and a large number of outbreaks, I couldn't fit them all on the, on the slide, uh, with outbreaks that have been occurring in, the, in recent years associated with sinks. And so, if you go around and culture sinks, if you take a swab and culture sinks in your facility, this is from the VA, uh, what you will find if you look at recovery of pathogens from hospital surfaces, we looked at moist, moist surfaces, which is mostly sinks, but also ice machines and dry surfaces. We get a lot of MRSA and VRE on bed rails and bedside tables and other dry surfaces. We, don't, we rarely get gram negatives from those surfaces because they die off more quickly on surfaces, on dry surfaces. But fluoroquinolone resistant gram negatives were frequently recovered from moist surfaces. Uh, they like to grow there, um, and candida species also uh, is very commonly found in moist uh, environments in the hospital. It's not clear to me why MRSA and VRE don't like growing in sinks because they're certainly capable of surviving well in moist environments, but presumably the nutrients and so on uh, are conducive to gram-negative organisms. So if you look at your sinks around the hospital here, you'll see that they all look perfectly clean. Someone can wipe them down, but there's no way to clean anything below the strainer and the sink. And so if you just take a swab, you can do this yourself, take a swab and just push it down about an, just below the strainer and then move it around a little bit, and this is what you will see. There's a big layer of biofilm and tons of bacteria down in the sink. And so this is out of the way. This doesn't seem like this should be a problem. And so the question is, so what? We have some bac bacteria in our sink. We have six logs of E. coli, uh, even resistant organisms in our sink. How is it going to get from the sink to the patient? So there's a nice paper that came out this year where they set up kind of a, a lab model to show us how that might happen. And so they set up a sink lab. This is at the University of Virginia. And <clears throat> in that lab, they, they, had an, they had some openings so they could, they could inoculate bacteria. So they inoculated some bacteria. 
uh, into what we call the P-trap of the sink. And then they fed the bacteria by putting some nutrient media down. And in the hospital, we do that by dumping Coca-Cola down the sink or dumping IV fluids. There's all kinds of things we're dumping down the sink all the time that provide nutrients for growth of bacteria. And then they watched what happened is the bacteria started to grow up from the, from the trap where they have water uh, up to the sink. And they, after about a week, they reached the strainer of the sink. So they've reached, the, uh, they've reached the sink bowl. And then they turned on the water and they observed that the, that the bacteria splattered everywhere, including out onto the countertop. And we've done several, we've currently begun looking at this at the VA and other facilities in, in, in town, and we see the same thing. Sinks are colonized with bacteria in Canada, and they, you can easily see dispersal of these organisms when you operate the sink. Same thing is, uh, occurs with ice machines. The drain on the ice machine is all contaminated with, with biofilms of bacteria, and the ice falls through the, through the, uh, the uh, grill and splatters bacteria. You can get splatter water on yourself. It's all, all full of uh, bacteria. So improving room design. So one of the ways we're trying to address this is improving room design to re reduce the risk for transmission from sinks. So here's an outbreak, an outbreak of Pseudomonas infections uh, that was attributed to the, to the sinks. And what they observed was that they were, pro they were prepping sample, pre prepping you know, clean items right next to the sink where the Pseudomonas was colonizing and potentially splattering over onto the the area, and so they simply renovated to uh, make it so there was, an there was a barrier between the sink and the air clean area where they were producing samples. Uh, there are other approaches that people are also taking. This is a simple little thing we're looking at now, which is a, a sink drain cap, which, which very nicely present, prevents dispersal from sinks. There's a, there's a large outbreak that had been going on over a decade at the University of Virginia, and in their experience, they, the, it was not the sinks that were the main problem. They have these bedpan cleaning areas where they have something called a hopper, and they put a cover over that uh, to prevent bacteria from splattering. And again, they had multiple years of highly resistant gram negatives that they attributed to a water source. Okay, so I have one more case that's going to illustrate another issue with waterborne uh, transmission of organisms. Uh, this is a patient that we saw at the VA. Uh, so it's a patient with a history of aortic valve replacement. His valve replacement actually occurred at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, one of their facilities. Uh, in 2014, he presented with fever and fatigue. His blood culture was negative. And so our organisms of uh, potential interest that we should be thinking of, Pseudomonas, Legionella, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And so there, are, there have been outbreaks of Pseudomonas infections post, in post-cabbage patients uh, due to surgeons who have you know, ha some hand, uh, uh, some nail issues with colonized with Pseudomonas. Uh, there have been outbreaks of, of uh, other organisms too with Pseudomonas. Legionella, if your water system is colonized with Legionella, there's a famous outbreak where people were taking showers soon after surgery and were getting Legionella, external wound infections. But those are, those are going to be relatively uncommon. Uh, the main thing that you should all be aware of, uh, all of you who take care of patients essentially, who may have had these types of procedures, are non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And so our patient, um, I would just say, so going back to our patient quickly, so our patient presented with fever and fatigue after having aortic valve replacement uh, in 2014. Uh, he was found to have an aortic root abscess. Um, when they went in and, and his blood culture, again, was negative, they, using molecular testing, they documented a mycobacterium species, mycobacterium uh, cloning, uh, I'm sorry, mycobacterium chimera in the valve. And uh, they also identified that in his blood uh, using molecular typing. And he subsequently, he still, uh, he had ultimately had aortic valve and root replacement and subsequently is still on four drug uh, treatment uh, to suppress that infection. And so how did this happen? Uh, so the, this is a, these are mycobacterium chimera. These are infections due to contaminated water source, heater cooler devices in this case. So the devices were contaminated by the water in the plant during manufacturing. Uh, these are the, these Levanova devices account for 60% of the U.S. market and are used around the world. Uh, so 250,000 surgeries per year with heater cooler devices in the United States. Uh, cultures of new devices, so even if you clean these devices well, you can, you can still grow the organism. So once the organism gets in there, it grows in a biofilm and it's hard to get rid of. So cultures of new devices purchased in 2014 grew M. chimera after 174 days despite intensified cleaning and disinfection protocols. So the organism is in there, and it's hard to get rid of uh, once it's there, and it potentially can 
uh, lead to infection of patients. Here's the device uh, in, from our facility. So it has tubing that leads up to the patient. It's designed to heat or cool as necessary during cardiac surgery. It has a fan which assists in the, in the cooling process uh, and also assists in disseminating mycobacteria. Uh, here, so there, this is not a very well closed system, so this is just a couple of examples of kind of holes, holes and gaps that potentially can lead to escape of water from the system while it's operating, of warm water, that can then again be dispersed by the fan. Uh, you would think that this should not, this should be a relatively minor issue because patients in the OR are, intent, we hope that they are being protected from airborne uh, organisms through the supply, dis, uh, through the air distribution supply. There's an air curtain that surrounds the patient. You can see air coming in from above and spreading out around the patient. So air that's coming in from the side should not enter that air curtain and your patient should be protected from things like cold negative staff and other organisms floating into the operating field. However, uh, what they found when you do a simulation, this is the device operating in an, in an OR, and if you turn it, in, in the upper uh, screen it's turned in one direction, if you turn it toward the, OR, toward the operating table, which it's often done, uh, and you turn on the fan, you can see dispersal of smoke heading straight toward the operating table, and what happened is they actually nicely demonstrated that the air would enter right into the top of that air curtain and basically be distributed straight down into the operating field, and this is how patients get uh, mycobacterium chimera. So we are, we are, we have contaminated health, health, uh, contaminated water system uh, with organisms growing in a biofilm, and a, a, we're creating a perfect mechanism to distribute it by, you know, having a heater cooler that heats up the water and, and sprays out a, an aerosol of uh, organisms around the operating room. Okay, a couple more quick cases. Uh, number five, which has been implicated as a source of the emerging fungal pathogen Candida auris? So Candida auris, if you don't know about it, is uh, it's a new, relatively new Candida species, which is resistant, which is uh, very concerning because it tends to be resistant to antifungals. So some of them are resistant to all three of the major antifungal classes. So are we, is our source farm animals, airborne dissemination, presenteeism, or contaminated portable equipment? So farm animals, no, that's C. diff. Airborne dissemination, mycobacterium chimera, no, so it's not C. auris. Presenteeism is how we give our patients influenza when we come to work sick and coughing. Uh, so that doesn't count uh, for Canada auris, hopefully. So it's contaminated portable equipment, and there are actually, there are actually two, um, two uh, presentations at the European ID Society meeting, which just came out on the news yesterday, where they linked... They, they, were, they, do, they find a lot of Canada or surviving in the environment, um, and they, they were doing standard cleaning, and they linked infections, uh, infectious outbreaks to multi-use thermometers and shared blood pressure cuffs uh, in this setting. And this is actually of interest. So thermometers are of interest because these have previously been linked to transmission of C. diff and VRE in the past. So back in the day when I was a resident, we used to all, the residents, would, you'd have a patient who didn't have a fever, but you, they looked sick, and so you would, tell, you, would, you would tell the nurse, why don't you get a rectal temperature on that patient? This was crazy. Um, and so we, the nurse would go in with a rectal thermometer and take a rectal temperature. So the handle of the, you can see the handle here. So the handle, while you're working with the patient, is going to become co contaminated with VRE and C. diff or whatever other organism you're working with. And then you touch the handle, and then you touch the cover that, as you're putting it on, and you're basically inoculating your patient directly with C. diff or VRE. And so there was a lot of interest in, in having disposable thermometers for patients with C. diff is actually recommended, um, and we've gone away from doing so many rectal temperatures, thankfully. Uh, but even, even non-rectal temperatures, we are, you, have, you have a contaminated handle. So this is a thermometer uh, from our facility in the patient room. And so we do careful monitoring of cleaning of, of bed rails, bedside tables, and so on. So this is a fluorescent marker that we put on this uh, thermometer handle, and this is something that's in our list of things that should be cleaned so this is after about a week and after three patients have been through the room that you know, nobody's ever cleaning this. People are, every, every time a patient comes in and out of the room, it's being touched frequently and potentially contaminated. So this is how these potential uh, things that, that are portable, we do a good job of cleaning bed rails, but a lot of portable devices are coming in and out of patient rooms. Uh, and so this is an, one of the problems that we face in trying to understand how important portable equipment is as a source of transmission is, 
you can show that it's contaminated, but, you, but we have relatively limited evidence for how it actually contributes to transmission. So one of the other new developments, so this is kind of a, 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 kind of a re-energized development in infection prevention is here, and that is the use of benign surrogate markers to study pathogen transmission. So this is something we're doing a lot of in the lab and other people are doing it as well. So you can take a DNA marker, so viral DNA, a cauliflower mosaic virus, a piece of viral DNA, or you can take a live virus that's completely harmless to people, in this case a bacteriophage, which infects E. coli, and you can put that anywhere you want in the hospital. You can put it on the floor, you can put it on somebody's tie, you can put it on whatever to sort out how things might be transmitted. And so we did a study on Rita John, one of our fellows, uh, did a study in our SICU, we contaminated, she contaminated uh, Doppler ultrasounds in the MICU EKG machines. And this is the data for the, for the MICU. Uh, so the EKG, ECG machines were contaminated, and she went back a day later to assess whether any of the viral DNA marker had gone from the ECG machine anywhere else in the unit. And as you can see, about 10% of, uh, of the time it was detected in patient rooms, uh, in common areas, on the, in the ICU, so it was being spread around the ICU. As people touch the EKG machine, they're not cleaning it between use, and then they, they're spreading it uh, onto surfaces in patient rooms. It can be spread around the unit. Uh, so, and then on day two, you see even more dissemination. And then something magical happened on day six, where there was suddenly there was no DNA marker anywhere in the ICU. And so we had no idea what had possibly gone on there, but Amrita said she had a suspicion for what had actually happened, because she went, when she went into the unit, there was bleach everywhere. And so this is bleach dripping from a television screen in the ICU. So if you want to improve environmental cleaning in your facility, all you have to do is you don't really have to even use them. Just walk around the unit carrying swabs. People will think that you're, you're monitoring their cleaning and just start cleaning furiously um, around the unit. So. Uh, but this, I think this study nicely demonstrates if you use these types of surrogate markers, you can really do more to study, you know, how things are being transmitted uh, in the hospital. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this case and just finish with a couple of quick comments about uh, there's, there's another kind of new development in infection prevention, which I think is just kind of beginning, is asking, you know, could patient and family participation improve infection prevention? Um, and there's interest in this in the ICU. This is something we're interested in at the VA. Um, we've done a lot of work with patient hand washing, uh, trying to look at how effective that might be in reducing MRSA on hands. Um, and this is for CDF, patient hand washing to reduce spore contamination. You can imagine if you are uh, in the hospital on, on, on clindamycin, you would be, it would probably be wise to do a lot of hand washing to reduce the likelihood that, you know, try to get any spores you pick up off your hands. If you're a patient who has a C. diff infection, uh, it makes sense to do a lot of hand washing to reduce the risk that you're going to re-inoculate yourself with C. diff uh, and, and, and have a high risk for recurrence. And so hand washing is not perfect, but you can see here there's a number, a lot of spores before hand washing. Uh, simple hand washing, soap and water can be quite effective in reducing the number of spores on the hands of a C. diff patient. Uh, and then the last example uh, is stewardship. Uh, so we typically think that patients are really part of the problem with stewardship. Patients and their families are always asking for antibiotics, and we blame them uh, instead of blaming ourselves for, uh, for you know, lapses in stewardship for asking us for antibiotics. Although typically we've trained them, so we tell some, we, someone has gotten an antibiotic for, for a cold in the past, and their cold got better, so they think maybe the antibiotic did that, so the next time they come in they're asking for another antibiotic. So we kind of have trained them, but we, we still blame them for asking us for antibiotics. So here's a study we did. Uh, with patients who are getting fecal transplants, so engaging patients in stewardship after fecal transplant for CDI. Uh, so this is here in Metro. So we tell patients after you've had a fecal transplant to call us if someone tries to prescribe an antibiotic for you so we can give you some feedback on whether you really need this antibiotic because these patients fear failure of the transplant, they, and they are very well aware of the adverse effects of antibiotics. So of 73 patients receiving FMT, 34% uh, called us, uh, this was either myself or Dr. Hecker from Metro, uh, regarding 43 antibiotic prescriptions. 60% were deemed unnecessary, and so we would get a call from the ER, and the, the, the ER physician would say, your patient is refusing to take an antibiotic unless you say it's okay for their bronchitis, and we would, get, we would give them some advice. 
there were, there were cases where antibiotics were necessary, but an alternative was suggested. So, for example, a patient might be recommended moxifloxacin, and we would suggest doxycycline, something that may be significantly less likely to promote C. diff. 95% uh, of these recommendations were followed. So with that, I will summarize. Um, so I think achieving zero healthcare-associated infections is now kind of the mantra in infection control. It remains a major challenge. Uh, test stewardship is necessary to avoid identification of colonization of infection, both for things like catheter-associated UTI and for um, C. diff infection. Current approaches may not adequately address sources such as water and portable equipment. Uh, new molecular typing methods and simulation studies can improve our understanding of pathogen transmission. And then I'll close with just one quick uh, additional comment, and that is that we should always be, you know, ready to think about kind of the unexpected. There's, we're always, you know, infection control and ID is nice because you never know. Uh, you may find something interesting if you just look at things we don't understand. So here's, here's a, some unexplained clusters of infections at the VA. So these are HAI's hospital-associated infections at the Cleveland VA Medical Center. And we look at these, we, every now and then we will see blips where we see a high rate of C. diff infection or, or other infections, and then we'll go through a period where we don't see any and we don't know, are we doing something right or are we doing something wrong? And so we've, we look at these uh, curves for a long time, and it was finally, and we kind of struggled to figure out what was going on, and it was finally, kind of serendipitously, we superimposed the medicine attending schedule <laughs> on the on the epidemic curve, and it suddenly became clear that the, our clusters were relate. When Dr. Bonomo was on service, we would see these tremendous clusters of infections. And for example, when Dr. Augustine was on service, like not, there was nothing. And so this, this looks bad for Dr. Bonomo, but when you, actually can, when you actually think further about this, there is an explanation for this. If you look at daily patient contacts during rounds, so Dr. Bonomo, like Dr. Salata, is, you know, when, when you're the chief and you're on rounds, you have to, you have to demonstrate esoteric exam features and <laughs> touch every patient, show how caring you are. And on the other hand, and plus, plus that tie has not been washed since 1995. <laughs> and on the other hand, Dr. Augustine's idea of a thorough exam is waving from the doorway. And so I think this really highlights the fact that we need to think about you know, we are vectors for transmission. We need to think about, you know, are there, is there more we can do to be more like uh, Dr. Augustine? And with that, I will uh, be happy to take questions. I would just also just quickly acknowledge, you know, a lot of people uh, have helped out in the lab doing infection control research over the years here, are a few of them, um, and so I just want to acknowledge their support. Thank you. Charlie's um, introduction, you know, I, um, I don't go to the IDSA meetings, but I, I listen to the digital, the digital broadcast, and all the C. diff sessions and all the, the other sessions refer to Dr. Donsky. So Dr. Donsky is a rock star in the C. diff world, national, international, and a thought leader in C. diff and health epidemiology, and it's really, you know, sort of the Beyonce of C. diff <laughs> control, something like that. And so I, I was listening to your presentation from the IDSA meeting, which one of the things that prompted me to invite you to give this grand rounds, which you should do every year without question. And, and you know, you, you mentioned this work today where, again, sort of a paradigm shift, I think those of us who have an interest in C. diff and, and triad of C. diff has sort of assumed that patients come in the hospital and two things happen. They, they get exposed to the environment in the hospital with lots of spores, and they pick up the spores, and then they get exposed to the antibodies, and they get C. diff. And what I think your work demonstrated is they're coming in with C. diff, and then we're giving them antibiotics. And again, I, don't, I thought that was a paradigm shift. I don't know if you want to make any further comments about that after my long speech. But, uh, yeah, no, so, so I think, you know, people still do acquire C. diff in the hospital. There's still, there's still um, a lot of room for improvement in preventing transmission. Our, our impression in looking at, at uh, kind of environmental contamination over the years of the VA is that infection control practices really improved pretty dramatically. We used to culture C. diff easily from surfaces in, in patient rooms, and now we do. We go in every day with bleach wipes and are wiping all of those surfaces in C. diff rooms, uh, and our general cleaning is much better than it used to be. So, we, you know, we, we're cleaning better. We're doing infection control, I think, better in many ways. So we're seeing less. Part of it is that we're right. seeing less transmission. Still transmitted, but less. And then, yes, there's, 
and there, there's no question, there's, uh, there's a clear paradigm shift that we know that a lot of patients are colonized with C. diff, and if you test that those patients who are colonized with C. diff, when they, ha when they get a laxative and they happen to have a loose stool the next day, you are very likely detecting a lot of patients who don't truly have infection who are colonized. Sure. Ms. Bob, so the uh, recent IDSA guidelines for testing for C. diff, aside from the treatment issue, now recommend the possibility of a two-step two -step process. Can you comment on that? Because we were, we switched over years ago to PCR for testing. <coughs> and what does PCR really detect? And it's been estimated Yeah, and, and Metro has, has, is making that switch to the two-step process. The, I think there are, there are some advantages of that process. You do still detect patients who are carrying C. diff and you can potentially isolate them but not, treat, not necessarily treat them. Um, and it does, it, clinically it kind of helps you. Our patient with the fecal ball might have gotten his surgery sooner if we hadn't been thinking that he really had C. diff infection. So there are some real potential advantages in understanding the disease. There are limitations of C. diff testing, though. So I think the Europeans are a little too, um, they're a little too certain of themselves that having a, a uh, positive EIA means that you have disease. We, there are stu old studies, and we have stu a study coming out, too, is showing that even if you're an, even asymptomatic carriers will sometimes have an EIA for toxin that's positive. So there's no perfect test for C. diff. Any, whatever testing method you use, it's going to require clinical judgment um, as well as the test. That's the point, because the PCR merely detects the organism, yeah. And it doesn't tell you whether it's actively producing toxin. Yep. It, is, uh, it is set forth so that it detects potential toxin producers, uh, but it's, it's not the be all and end all. So therefore, introducing toxin determination <coughs> first, and then going to see that, I mean, uh, PCR as an adjudicator. So that's uh, so that's a great question. So I kind of group stethoscopes with all of this other kind of portable devices that are going in and out of rooms uh, you know, with Doppler ultrasounds, et cetera. It's, they're all part of the same continuum. So we did a study uh, several years ago with one of our medical students um, uh, who's now actually yeah, still, still doing research, actually, so it didn't hurt him to work with us in the lab. So he, he did a study with us where he went in and examined patients with C. diff or MRSA, and then he assessed how, how well the stethoscope would kind of pick up and then transfer pathogens. And the stethoscope was not quite as good, but just about as good as your hands at picking up organisms and transferring them. So my impression is that stethoscopes are probably underappreciated as a source of transmission. I do see people who put, uh, you know, try to put a glove over the stethoscope and so on, but I, I think stethoscopes are probably underappreciated as a source of transmission. This, again, is another one of those perfect areas where we could use something like our kind of our DNA marker, we could put a live benign virus on stethoscopes or a DNA marker and really show kind of movement from one patient to another with stethoscopes. I think a couple more studies like that and we might be able to really do more to emphasize that in infection control. Yeah. Yes. What about, what about, what about uh, these things? So ties and so, so, so we, so we did a study with, uh, so I'm Rita John again, our fellow, did a nice study where we did, so in England they, in England and in a lot of other places, they, they emphasize this bare below the elbows approach. And so with that, instead of wearing the long white coat, um, you wear scrubs and no, no ties or bow tie if you want to wear a tie. Um, so it again is another area that we could, that could be studied. So we found in a lab simulation at least that wearing short, short sleeve white coats, short sleeve coats, led to less transfer of 
of a DNA marker than wearing long sleeve coats. So ties are kind of that's kind of the next frontier of uh, infection prevention. I'd lo I'd love to get rid of them myself. The residents so. just don't want to wear ties. It's not in, it's not evidence based yet. But, it's uh, coming. Okay. That was my the tie question. Yeah. Hand washing is still the fundamental. Fundamental, fundamental yes. Always, 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 always. Um, any last comments or questions, Dr. Chomsky? If not, as always, it's delightful to hear you, and, and we're you know, lucky to have this international luminary of, you know, come across the street, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.